Um, Alex is coming to us from our uh, London University, New College of the Humanities, and um, he is an associate professor with us. So I don't want to take any more of his time. I will let you all know that if you do have questions, we will leave some time for that at the end of the webinar. So please just add them to the chat message area and we'll be sure to address them as soon as, as, soon as we finish with the presentation. So without further ado, Alex, take it away. Thank you very much. I hope you can uh, all uh, see my slides. Um, so as Amanda was saying, uh, uh, I'm Alexandros, you can call me Alex. Um, I am indeed uh, at uh, the New College of Humanities, but uh, I work with uh, uh, primarily in computer systems, you know, data systems, and lately at the intersection of uh, data systems and um, deep learning. So without further ado, you know, like I would like to uh, set a little bit the stage. You know, uh, nowadays we, you know, train machines by giving it lots and lots of data, lots of uh, uh, labeled examples, rather than a program. And uh, uh, we train it to make good predictions. And when the output uh, is wrong, we try to tweak uh, uh, the model parameters. So here in the magnifying glass, we can see in the application, if we consider an application such as image classification, we, um, uh, we, our goal is to train these model parameters. And uh, there are a number of configurations, both for the model and the training system, which uh, we call hyperparameters. So, if uh, anything, you know, when I set out to, you know, to uh, write the abstract and title for this talk, I was mentioning, you know, combating performance and accuracy trade-offs. And uh, in this talk, I would like to pick uh, three areas. Uh, the first one is, uh, which I would like you to, you know, hopefully it will be the takeaway message here. Uh, the first one is to um, decouple hyperparameters uh, for our system from uh, system performance. Uh, how, you know, we, uh, how can we sparsify models to achieve better performance? And uh, finally, some work in progress on how we can adapt our run runtime to learning patterns. And I will try to focus first on, on the first one. Now, uh, what do we mean here? First of all, some, uh, um, uh, some terminology. What do I mean by, by performance? Uh, we have uh, um, two quantities of interest here. The first one is uh, the statistical efficiency of our model, how accurately it makes our predictions. So I will use terms such as model accuracy or statistical efficiency to denote that. And on the other hand, we have our system performance, which is essentially, you know, uh, how fast can we train um, uh, our model? Because uh, uh, at the end of the day, we are interested in, um, uh, in fast execution, right? The time to accuracy, time to some given accuracy is uh, a very important metric. And now in a system, we have this kind of parameters. Some of them are used to tune the model and some are used to tune our system, for example, the number of workers. And we have some parameters, uh, for example, the training batch size or even the, uh, the precision of, uh, of our model that actually affect both. So in this talk, uh, in the first part of the talk, I will focus on um, uh, our uh, training system, Crossbow, uh, trying to scale deep learning models with small batch sizes on multi-GPU servers. And uh, what do I mean by that? So one minute, there you are. Okay, so training with uh, uh, on GPU servers, training a model on a GPU. Essentially, we have our data set, uh, which contains labeled examples. And we will pick a sample from this data set, which we will call uh, our processing bots, our bots or mini bots. And uh, uh, we will pass it on to our processor, the GPU. It will do a forward pass, make a prediction, 
And depending on the error, we are going to compute the uh, gradient, what we will use to update our weights. Okay, so that the next time we can make uh, better predictions. Now, typically the bot size, when it comes, for example, to image classification is between 32 to 256 label images. If I want to use a second GPU, what I will try to uh, uh, normally try to do is uh, uh, employ some weak scaling approach. Right? If I have twice as much compute, I will try to process twice as much data. So I will pick a bigger batch from my data set and split it between uh, uh, the two processors. Now, every GPU will have the copy uh, of uh, the same model parameters and uh, each of them will compute a gradient, which I will then average and apply to uh, my model. So essentially now we have two GPUs performing one stochastic gradient step uh, in unison. And if, you know, if I want to further scale, I will, uh, you know, with three or more uh, processors, I will keep getting more and more data from my data set, right? I will keep considering a bigger batch. The idea here is that we want to keep the work per GPU constant in order to scale. Now, a prominent uh, uh, feature, uh, person in, uh, in deep learning uh, once tweeted that training with large mini batches is bad for your health. More importantly, it's bad for your test error. Friends don't let friends use mini batches larger than 32. So what did he mean by that? Well, the only reason that we want to increase the bat size when we are training a model is primarily, you know, like hardware efficiency. Okay, as I described. But the problem that we have is uh, infrequently less noisy updates. So if we see our, uh, uh, our example again on, on the left, we have our, uh, our GPU processing the bats, computing a gradient and updating the weights. And on the left, we can see uh, how we are, uh, uh, how we take a step exploring the parameter space, um, you know, to set, to find the, the best value. Here we perform a single step. The next time, uh, when I process the next bats, I will use the updated weights and compute a gradient that will further improve my model. And uh, um, uh, in this way, I can try to find uh, a near optimal solution. But when I consider scaling this, as I described with a bigger batch and two processors, the two GPUs will use uh, uh, the same weights. We will average the gradients and therefore we are always only going to perform a single step. When we average the gradients, we can, uh, we can normalize them with a parameter, the, uh, the learning rate. And uh, tuning the learning rate, it's uh, a nice mitigation to, uh, to this problem. However, there are some limitations. One of the most common uh, uh, rules for uh, scaling uh, is that when we increase the bat size you know, by multiple of, uh, of K, then we should uh, multiply the learning rate by k. And uh, uh, this approach works really well, uh, but up to a certain point. Okay, so here in this graph, we see our, uh, our error, uh, but we can uh, try to keep constant uh, up to bad size of 8,000, at which point performance will start to collapse. So we set to design a system that is uh, capable of preserving the merits of small but training at scale uh, while having high hardware efficiency. And in doing so, we had to address a number of challenges. For example, the first one is, you know, how we can, if we have a, a small data sample to process on, uh, uh, on a very powerful, say, GPU, how we can keep the uh, hardware utilization high. And the rest of the challenges I will, I will cover shortly. I will not go into the details of the system itself, but uh, um, uh, hopefully I will have some time to tell you about it. So how 
can we uh, process small batches uh, efficiently? Well, what's the problem? The problem is that having one batch per GPU, there, is, there might be not enough data and instruction parallelism for every operator. So if we think of uh, our, uh, uh, our model that consists of uh, uh, three operators here, the blue, uh, orange, and, and green, and plus uh, the computation of uh, an update of, uh, of our model, you know, the utilization might you know, be, uh, first of all, it varies across operators and might be low. So our idea is uh, to treat this whole process, you know, like processing uh, uh, minibuds uh, as, uh, uh, you know, as a learner that we can assign on, uh, on a GPU stream, which is a, 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 a level of concurrency that we can get on, on the GPU and try to train multiple models on the same GPU, okay? So if this is our learner, we can have many of those and on a single GPU, we can try to schedule them and run in parallel. The problem with this, okay, so great. Once I have multiple replicas, you know, uh, being trained per GPU concurrently, surely I can have high um, hardware utilization but how can we synchronize them? If we don't synchronize them, then it's like training separate models. So why so should we not use a synchronous uh, stochastic gradient descent as I described uh, before? Well, the problem is that if two learners, let's say compute, uh, uh, compute an update, uh, they will diverge, okay? But then once we average, uh, the gradients and or or the models, uh, then we are going to start from the same point, okay? And uh, uh, they are going to diverge again for one step, but then uh, coming back again together, which uh, essentially we have performed here six steps, but uh, on in terms of the average model, it's only three, and this uh, causes limited exploration of the parameter space. So our idea here, when it comes to um, uh, synchronizing, is to allow the different learners to diverge, but not too much, okay? And how do we do that? By correcting their trajectory at every step according to the average model. So in, uh, uh, on the slide again, you know, these blue arrows are our two learners uh, uh, exploring uh, the space independently. Yes, we can compute uh, the average model, model trajectory, but what we use it is we use it to correct the independent uh, learners, okay, so that they don't diverge uh, a lot. And at the same time, uh, so they can continue their exploration from different points. And at the same time, we can also accelerate the average model trajectory using uh, momentum to um, here we know uh, we accelerate with momentum so that uh, at the end if we follow this process the interesting thing is that the accelerated average model trajectory will find uh, better minima faster so we have uh, implemented uh, these uh, ideas across uh, uh, on our system, uh, Crossbow. It has uh, other compo interesting components, uh, you know, like data preprocessors, you know, memory management. Um, it has an auto-tuner to automatically find the, um, the right number of learners that you can put uh, per GPU. Um, it has also been uh, integrated with TensorFlow, which is also the baseline of, uh, of our system. And uh, now I will go on and show you some results. So first of all, is Crossbow training effective using small batch sizes? Well, on, uh, on the y-axis, I'm going to show you a time to test accuracy. So we have uh, an accuracy goal for our model, ResNet 32 on one GPU. And we measure how, uh, how fast we can reach it. And if we look into results from, uh, from TensorFlow, 
you know, if we, uh, if, if we give our GPU a batch size of uh, 64, 64 examples, it takes approximately uh, uh, 1,100 seconds. And if we give it a bigger batch, okay, 256, it takes almost half the time. Now, if we give Crossbow a batch size of 64 and a single learner, we can already see that its, uh, uh, its performance now uh, in the aggregate, you know, time to test accuracy is, uh, is, uh, um, uh, is very similar to having a batch size of 256. And why is that? Because statistical efficiency improves because of our uh, synchronous model averaging method. And when we put more learners, so if we put four learners on the GPU, so training four models and synchronizing them, each with batch size 64, which is the equivalent of having one big batch of 256, we can see that the performance uh, further increases uh, threefold. And uh, is crossbow training effective across models? Because I just saw you uh, ResNet. Uh, uh, yes, training with multiple learners is always better than training with uh, large batches. And uh, if we see the speed up that we can get over TensorFlow, you know, across uh, one GPU or uh, uh, even eight GPUs, uh, our speed ups uh, range from uh, 1.2 to uh, 4.3 uh, times uh, uh, faster when it comes to time to accuracy, okay? So in summary, Crossbow improves hardware efficiency uh, of small bots training by training uh, uh, multiple replicas per GPU. It prolongs the convergence properties of small bots training with synchronous model averaging. And uh, it uh, ensures that tasks that can run concurrently are run concurrently uh, because it boasts an efficient multi-GPU task management system uh, written in C. So this is, uh, you know, my, um, the end of almost the first part. And, you know, when I finished this work, you know, Crossbow, um, it alters the synchronization algorithm, but uh, it leaves the model uh, that we are training unchanged. And uh, we, you know, in retrospect, uh, it could have exploited uh, layers that benefit small batch training. For example, variants of um, uh, batch, batch normalization that work really well uh, with uh, small batch sizes. And there are ways of finding these uh, alternative models, you know, starting to modify the model. You can try to do it automatically or you can try to do it uh, with experts. But it's a, a kind of route that led me to, um, to GraphCore research and um, where I had an opportunity to work with um, uh, research scientists uh, designing model for, uh, for language understanding. Uh, and it brings me nicely to the second area, uh, you know, the second uh, battleground when it comes to performance and accuracy trade-offs, which is uh, model size, okay? So somehow we know now that uh, as we increase uh, the number of parameters of our model, so we expect to get higher accuracy, uh, but uh, our goal should be to achieve the same accuracy with less parameters and uh, sparsification of the models, uh, sparsity is one way of, of doing this. So next I'm going to discuss uh, group BERT, a transformer architecture using efficient group structures to try to achieve this one. I don't know how much I can say in terms of motiv motivating language understanding models and language models. I think, you know, we, we have heard uh, a lot about it, uh, I suppose, in the news, but the idea is that model sizes, uh, you know, the size of the model in terms of parameters uh, increases keeps increasing, uh, it increased rapidly, almost by three orders of magnitude in just a few years. And uh, the other thing is that uh, uh, work from uh, OpenAI on scaling laws for, uh, for language model 
It was telling us that the more computers, the more data and the more parameters we have, uh, it uh, improves performance, right? So if I see this kind of results and try to, to abstract a little bit, you know, if we look, at, if we look at in terms of uh, our model accuracy, yes, we have some baseline model and uh, the more we add compute power, the more we add data and the more we add parameters, uh, accuracy will improve, which is fine. You know, like it's, it's nice to understand the, uh, uh, the limits um, uh, of, this, uh, of this scaling but it's also important to try to find ways of uh, bending this line so that we, you know, we don't use so much resources. So our focus here is on BERT and uh, BERT is a, a, the model uh, for language understanding uh, uh, tasks. Uh, it uses uh, a technique called uh, self-supervised learning. So how it works? Well, we are going to learn um, uh, uh, representation of words. So we have like a very large data set. We have the entire Wikipedia data set, you know, in parentheses, you know, with, uh, with all its biases and everything. We tokenize it and we start feeding our model sequences of, uh, of these words. And uh, 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 it's uh, self-supervised in a way that what we do during, uh, especially the pre-training phase, we hide some words, okay? We mask them and uh, we let the model try to predict, to predict them, okay? So there is no specific task yet. Uh, what we try to do is try to optimize uh, the prediction of these masked words with the MLM loss and also the prediction of the next sentence uh, with the NSP loss. And once uh, we train our model and we, uh, in this pre-training phase, then we can apply it on a downstream task where we can have like a much smaller uh, concentrated data set on a specific task uh, and uh, fine tune our language model in tasks such as question answering. Okay, so we can give it as input uh, a question and a paragraph of text and it can tell us uh, you know, where the answer lies in this paragraph, giving us two pointers, you know, where it starts and where it ends. Uh, you know, there are a number of other tasks, primarily in the results I will show uh, today, I will focus on, uh, on question, uh, question answering. So the BERT language model, uh, when I uh, hear, you know, when I was mentioning, um, the model, uh, you know, we have like uh, these encoders and the encoder, encoders essentially uh, a stack of uh, the, uh, some ba this basic block that you can see on, uh, on the screen. Uh, and this basic block basically consists of two layers primarily. The first one is a multi-head attention and the other one is a, a feed forward network also um, uh, called uh, the boom layer as uh, uh, you will see later on. So essentially what we give as input is a sequence of words, which we embed in a number of dimensions, let's say D. And basically attention will find us uh, um, uh, content-based ba content -based interactions uh, between uh, our words. Okay, how much attention one word should pay to all the other words in our, uh, in our sequence. And in addition, we have a form of positional encoding, uh, uh, allowing attention to also capture position-based uh, interactions, and it gives uh, this kind of uh, uh, um, you know uh, this kind of uh, operators uh, give BERT um, a strong representation power. The second layer, the fit-forward layer, it acts as a, a regularizer and norm normalizer, but basically, you know, it uh, it improves performance. Now, when it comes to scaling, you know, we have our BERT base, which uh, is a model of 110 parameters. And if we want to scale a language model, we have to make it both wider and deeper. So on, uh, on the X axis here on the plot, you can see, you know, we can increase the number of dimensions and also add more encoders to the stack. Okay, so if we go from BERT base to BERT large, we have uh, uh, 300 million parameters. You know, it's a threefold increase 
with um, uh, more dimensions and more encoders. And we can go smaller, right? You can go to and derive BERT medium and BERT small with 40 million parameters and 30 million parameters respectively. And so the idea here is that more parameters means uh, better accuracy. And this is what we can save from our uh, squad, squad results uh, when we run it, um, when we train these models. Okay, so the bigger the model, uh, the higher uh, the um, statistical efficiency. But the problem is that adding more parameters means I need more floating point operations. For example, uh, when it comes to BERT large, uh, the theoretical flop count is uh, 183 exaflops. So we are talking about you know 10 with uh, 20 zeros followed by 10 20 zeros. And uh, something has to give, right? So we set out to, uh, to design a group BERT uh, and uh, IPU transformer based on uh, group structures. So this was work uh, done at uh, uh, GraphCore. Uh, you know, I started with GraphCore research. It was recently completed by, uh, by my colleagues. But the goal here is that, you know, derive a BERT uh, uh, um, model that preserves statistical efficiency uh, with uh, uh, improved hardware efficiency. Now, uh, you know, GraphCore builds, uh, uh, it's a semiconductor company, it builds these uh, um, uh, IPU processors that they really favor fine-grained computations with strong memory locality. So we know that group computations are, um, are really suited for this processor, but the challenge is uh, to make sure that when we use uh, group structures, we need to maintain the expressivity of, uh, of the model. So we have uh, 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 proposed basically two main um, uh, group structures. The first one is a group convolution. And what's the problem here what we are trying to solve? Well, attention, uh, sure, it can, it can capture uh, both uh, short range and uh, long range dependencies uh, between, uh, between the words uh, in, our, in our sequence. Uh, but uh, uh, observing, you know, the results, uh, you know, we can see that it exhibits uh, some, you know, some attention uh, layers exhibit strong locality preference. So uh, this is a way of, you know, how I would uh, describe attention to you, you know, very briefly, which is you can see it like as a matrix where um, we can assign uh, a score uh, how much attention one word should pay to all the other words in the sequence. Okay, so the diagonal, uh, looking into the diagonal of this matrix, uh, we are looking into uh, uh, a word and its uh, uh, close neighbors, you know, left and right of this word. And as we go further apart, uh, these are uh, distances, uh, words uh, that are uh, more distant uh, in the sequence, in the input sequence. So to overcome this problem, our idea was to use a, a dedicated convolution module, uh, essentially uh, using group convolutions. And uh, the idea here is that the convolution uh, can uh, model strictly local position-based uh, interactions, leaving the multi-head attention to focus on, uh, uh, on long rates um, uh, attention. The second group structure, that um, uh, we introduced, we focused on uh, the um, fit-forward uh, network, right? The second uh, uh, layer in uh, our uh, encoder. And what this uh, uh, layer does essentially is that it will take uh, our words embedded in uh, the dimension, the number of dimensions, and uh, it will uh, expand the number of dimensions by you know, fourfold, and then it will uh, string it back again okay, with two matrix multiplications. And the problem is that this layer is very expensive. Okay? It accounts for almost two thirds of the computational cost uh, of, of BERT because uh, it performs uh, very dense matrix multiplications. So our idea here, was uh, to try to use some uh, uh, um, sparse structures. And uh, what we observed 
is that although trying to sparsify the first uh, uh, set of parameters in the, in the, in the first uh, matrix multiplication, uh, this was deteriorating performance. The second matrix multiplication was more amenable to sparsification because after all, when we expand our input into uh, four times more dimensions, essentially we sparsify. So our idea was to use a block diagonal matrices and uh, perform a, a group matrix multiplication, reducing the number of parameters and essentially uh, floating point operations uh, in this uh, second matrix multiplication by, uh, uh, by four. Okay, so it was uh, four times less parameters. So put together, you know, our proposal essentially is that, you know, before we had a multi-head attention and a feed uh, forward network, now, we have a convolution and a multi-head attention, each of them followed by a grouped feed-forward network. Okay. And there are some other modifications, you know, minor modifications that don't affect the uh, parameter count. Uh, but, you know, you must be thinking that, okay, wait a minute, now we must have added more parameters to the model, right? So this is, uh, uh, this sounds, you know, the model is deeper and has like more operations. So indeed, uh, uh, we did add, but uh, let's see uh, a simple ablation study right, when it comes to pre-training. So on the graph, uh, we have on the y-axis, we have the uh, MLM loss uh, and we start with Burke base. Okay, so we had like our 110 uh, million parameters. So when we added the convolution, we increase the parameters by a factor of 1.2. So we did add more parameters, but we also see an improvement in convergence. Adding the grouped feed forward networks, it further increased the parameters by uh, 1.2, but it also showed a, a significant uh, improvement in performance. So overall, we have our model, which has now more parameters, but it's more efficient. Now let's see what happens if we look into uh, BERT, uh, um, vanilla BERT. So here again, we start from our BERT base and in order to reach the accuracy, you know, the, the same loss level as a, a group BERT with these additions, we had to go to BERT large, which means increasing the number of parameters and so respectively the number of uh, 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 floating point operations by times three. Okay. So essentially group BERT uh, compared to BERT large achieves similar loss with half the size. So when we looked into the performance of uh, downstream tasks, okay, uh, and again, looking into, uh, into this code here, now we saw the BERT results, the, the black line. Okay, uh, and now I plot it in terms of uh, you know number of uh, number of parameters. Uh, group BERT is the red line, and what we can see is that it can achieve same level of accuracy, but with uh, half the parameters, uh, and this also translates to uh, half the time to train. Okay, so not only it, used, uh, it was more, uh, more efficient in terms of uh, uh, model size and uh, theoretical flops, but also it manifested into uh, actual time to train. So hopefully I managed to give you a good idea in terms of we want to exploit uh, locality. Okay, both in, as, a, as a structural property, you know, the proximity of words and structure in language. And why is this important? Because, well, maybe, you know, we can manifest it into, you know, like memory locality and um, try to improve uh, our, uh, our computations. So, for example, we can see our attention map, as I was saying, you know, like how each word relates to, to all the other ones as an adjacency matrix of, uh, of a network. And indeed, a lot of people uh, will try, you know, have tried to, you know, build this kind of patterns. So when it came to uh, building language models using um, 
you know, based on a pension, you know, they wanted to infer some patterns, right? You know, I don't want to look into all possible relations between the words. I'm interested in looking into uh, local relations, you know, short range um, uh, dependencies with some, uh, you know, uh, further away, uh, uh, you know, sorry, uh, looking into, in addition, looking into the, you know, relation with some uh, uh, words further away in the sequence, you know, and, you know, people could argue that, okay, you know, uh, language, you know, uh, it's, uh, you know, can be modeled as a, you know, as, as a small world network, so we can specify this kind of patterns. Now, the question is, uh, should these patterns be, you know, pre-compiled, predetermined, or should we just uh, observe them as they emerge during our execution? Which brings me to the last part of, um, of uh, this talk, uh, where uh, you know I began to explore, uh, you know, uh, how we can, uh, uh, well, forming the question, which is essentially, you know, how we can adapt uh, uh, our runtime, uh, you know, when these uh, uh, patterns can change. Because surely there is a performance on the table that we can uh, that we can use. And this is based on um, uh, a recent project, a uh, recent funded project uh, at NCH, uh, what we started with colleagues here, Brian Ball and Mike PC, uh, and uh, it is about uh, the spread of misinformation. So you know, I'm not. I hope I'm not taking a very big leap of faith, but you know, when it comes to to networks. Uh, you know, why don't look into an application that actually uses networks as uh, as an input? Okay. So some motivation first. Uh, you know, you can think of you know COVID. You can think of Brexit and or you know uh, um, climate change, right? So as individuals, we have a particular belief on certain topics, and uh, as we are part of society, our belief can be swayed by others, uh, you know, when, you know, as they provide us with more information uh, as we're having discussions, especially nowadays where, you know, a lot of interactions happen uh, with social networks and uh, we have algorithms that will make suggestions to us uh, as well as uh, uh, algorithms that will, well, will try to sway us in the, in the, in the wrong direction. So, in order to combat uh, misinformation, I, we need to understand, first of all, the dynamics of how information spreads. Uh, you know, try to understand, you know, uh, uh, situation, you know, why and when polarization uh, uh, arises in this, kind of, in this kind of settings. And if we really want to combat it, we also want to be able to do this proactively and make predictions, okay? So we have, uh, 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 a learning system. So I will try to make uh, a brief introduction to the problem. I hope you like the example. Uh, essentially, uh, I'm trying, you know, I will try to look into a very simple instance uh, of, of the problem, which is about learning from uh, neighbors. Okay, so we have an individual uh, placed in a world where uh, uh, the individual has to make a choice between uh, two restaurants. Okay, so we have uh, the brand new restaurant X, which uh, in uh, in the world that we are building, you know, we know it's uh, it's better. You know, it's going for uh, for a Michelin star, and we have the restaurant Y, which is uh, the uh, uh, the go-to place for for many years, and um, uh, and we trust. So the question is. You know how can we choose uh, uh, where to go? Well, we will have our belief, right? If uh, if some believes that you should go and try restaurant X, then you can go and try. But uh, if it believes, uh, if he or she believes that uh, um, uh, restaurant Y is the best choice, then it will go to restaurant Y. The problem is that if this individual believes that Y is better and goes there. Uh, you know, she will never visit X, okay? Uh, so how can we change uh, uh, her mind? 
Well, we let her accept evidence from her friends, right? From neighboring nodes in, uh, in the social graph, but might have tried this new restaurant. Okay, so uh, this friend here, uh, um, uh, colored red, uh, will visit restaurant X. It will sample some of this is there and uh, it will go and send a message saying, hey, I tried five dishes and four of them were amazing. Yeah. This way, um, our individual can be, uh, uh, can change uh, her mind and next time visit restaurant X. Now, in, you know, theory tells us that in this kind of model, even learning from neighbors and even, even doing this under uncertainty, uh, eventually the network will converge to the true state of the world, which is restaurant X is better. So everybody will make uh, the same decision at the end. Now, if I try to look this from uh, an algorithmic perspective, okay, because uh, I'm still in the, uh, in, uh, um, you know, you know, this talk is still about uh, systems, you know, we can see it it's a very simple algorithm, right? We have our, our inputs is a, is a graph, you know, our social network with nodes and edges. We have some initial beliefs and uh, uh, we can configure how we can take our samples. So I can write, you know, the whole uh, learning process in, in one line. I will say, you know, uh, first of all, you know, every node that goes to restaurant X will collect some evidence by sampling a binomial distribution. Okay, so we'll get a vector uh, with one element per node. Then nodes will send their evidence to their neighbors, okay, using the uh, adjacency matrix of, uh, of the graph. Uh, now, every node will sum all the evidence, including um, uh, its own that has uh, that has received, and uh, with this evidence, it can go and compute the uh, bias rule. Okay, using essentially uh, the likelihood of obtaining that evidence uh, times uh, the prior belief, you know, uh, will be proportional to uh, the posterior. In other words, I can uh, perform this computation using linear algebra operations. Okay, so you can, you know, like I can get the sum of the evidence by just doing a, a simple matrix multiplication between the adjacency matrix and the samples obtained from, uh, from its node. So in this setting, uh, what I have been working on now is essentially a computational framework to do this kind of computations and more. So uh, um, I, the first, and you know, meanwhile, you know, trying to uh, uh, have some requirements. So the requirements were, you know, like uh, um, I wanted the system to have uh, syn both synthetic and real-world graphs readily available. Now, when it comes to specifying these uh, operations, um, I'm uh, advocating uh, an API where you can actually. Uh, express your computation with just a handful of uh, functions at uh, the edge level, the node level, and, and the graph level. And uh, uh, you know, in, in this system, I'm trying to support both uh, um, uh, structural learning, you know, like running algorithms such as you know, page rank and so on, as well as attribute-based learning, as for example, the example I gave before, you know, like uh, updating beliefs, uh, which is essentially an attribute of, of the node and uh, support graphs with uh, multiple relations. Support uh, differentiable functions, because at the end of the day, we want to perform inferences. Hence, I'm building on top of uh, the PyTorch uh, uh, learning framework here. And finally, you know, like a seamless, at least uh, from, uh, from a user point of view, uh, scalability on uh, on heterogeneous servers okay be it, you know cpu gpu or uh, or ipu and now you know having set this up i um i started running you know like some experiments and i would like to you know like conclude with uh, this uh, observation uh, that uh, i have been making uh, um, which is as follows so 
if we take a, a, a fully connected network, okay, uh, and we look into its sparsity, its sparsity will be 100%, right? Every, every node is connected to every other one. So what I will be showing you on the, on the y-axis when I say sparsity essentially is the proportion of the edges that contribute to the learning process. Uh, so as you know, the, the model converges, uh, we will see on the, on the y-axis here, you know, percentage of convergence out of the total steps, we look into you know, what proportions of edges contribute. Okay. Uh, and uh, I said, to, you know, I give you an example of a very small network, which means you know, I'm trying to avoid uh, uh, you know, memory bounds and so on. And what I have been observing, the interesting thing is that the computation time you know, per step is, uh, uh, is constant. Okay, so it's approximately 10 milliseconds per step. But if I now start taking snapshots of, uh, of uh, the graph uh, uh, as, it, as it learns which restaurant uh, is best, what, we, you know, what I observe is, uh, is the following, okay? So in uh, the first 60% of, uh, of the execution, uh, not all edges, therefore nodes contribute to the learning process. So there is a, a lot of sparsity to be exploited. You now, after 60%, you know, sparsity reaches uh, one, which means that um, all edges are uh, actively uh, contributing to the learning process. But here, you know, like coming from the systems world, if I look into like um, uh, uh, the tail of uh, the tail of the result, uh, I can think of ways, you know, like uh, of how we can skip computations. For example, by looking into nodes that have converged, uh, um, and you know, like so that there is no point of updating. But if I look into the first part, well, look, I, I can observe these uh, information cascades as they occur, you know, so, you know, uh, how the public can be swayed from one opinion to the next. Uh, but what I'm, you know, what I'm, the question that I'm posing here is that, uh, how can I take advantage of these patterns uh, so that I can make my system malleable to them so that the execution time per step uh, is not, constant, but uh, it can exploit sparsity, for example, and go faster. Okay. So I think this is it. I hope, I hope you, you know, I hope you really enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to re, uh, um, uh, refresh your memory once again about these uh, three areas that I was trying to, uh, to put forward as uh, battlegrounds for performance versus accuracy trade-off when you are building learning systems. So the first one was to uh, uh, try to decouple hyperparameters uh, uh, that uh, are going to affect my system uh, performance. And I focused on, uh, on crossbow and uh, uh, the parameter is bat size. Then uh, I talked about uh, uh, how we can sparsify models to achieve better performance. And I gave you the example of group BERT. And finally, I tried to give you an idea of uh, uh, you know, work in progress, hence the question at the end, but uh, uh, which is, you know, why our learning systems, you know, how can we make our learning systems more malleable to, uh, to learning patterns? Thank you, Alex, a great talk. Uh, I loved your last project. I want to see the results later. And, and great slides too. Um, uh, Michael Porter has the first question. Is uh, he asks if can you highlight the key difference between crossbow training versus scaffold training in federated learning, since both add corrective turn and perform synchronous graded descent with model rec replicas and different data. So it's uh, on the chat if you want to read it yourself too. Yeah. So I, I missed the, the last part. Uh, can I see where? Yeah, because he said that the scaffold training and, and crossbow training do the same things. Uh, so what are the differences? Uh, 
I, I wasn't aware of uh, the uh, scaffold training. Uh, I, I understand that you know, some of the concepts we have been working on uh, in Crossbow are applicable to federated learning. Uh, but um, you know, since there, you know, we have the problem of, uh, yeah, you don't want to have models um, uh, uh, going to, to the cloud and so on. But, you know, Michael, you know, if you send me uh, a message and I can look into scaffold, I can tell you, uh, you know, the differences, okay? And Ben has uh, asked, uh, could you explain a bit more how the convolution layer captures short-term dependencies? Well, you know, the way I the way I see it is essentially, uh, as you know, we have our sequence of words, and uh, you know, with, uh, with convolutions, is like applying a, a sliding window um, uh, uh, on uh, on this sequence, which actually will give us, uh, um, you know, the um, the short term, you know, like a, you know, for every word, it will look only. Um, uh, uh, um, a specific, uh, you know, a specific range of a specific range of words. Uh, then, um, Hannes Ben asks, uh, how applicable do you see deep learning when combined with uh, RPTG, so remote uh, photoplethysmography? They, they know all this, and cloud computing, considering today's technological capabilities in the marketplace. So maybe. Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, Haynes. Uh, I I don't know. Um, uh, uh, you know, remote photo photoplethysmography. Um, yes. So I don't know the I don't know the application to to give you an informed uh, opinion. <laughs> I can ask a related question of something I have seen uh, lately that has to be more like uh, edge computing instead of cloud computing. So trying, people trying to do uh, training in, in, in the edge. So what mm -hmm. do you think about that? If, if that, that will be a trend? With, with sensors like uh, IoT that are 20 billion. Uh, yes, look, uh, I think <laughs> this question, I mean, I might have, uh, uh, you know, something to say, which is, uh, um, you know, it, it depends. A lot of uh, a lot of the optimizations that uh, uh, people have been making making in, uh, in in models, especially on the second part, you know, like when you know talking about like specification and trying to make it more efficient. You know, specification is one way you can think about, you know, lowering the precision and so on is to make them, you know, to make it possible to run them on these small devices, okay? And uh, we can use them for inference. Uh, and uh, uh, so, you know, when it comes to federated learning, for example, and, uh, and so on, then yes, we say, okay, let's try to train a model on these devices. Uh, but I would say, uh, uh, you know, do you want to train, you know, your entire model there? Uh, you know, I would, uh, I would say, you know, try to build a system at, at different scales uh, using, you know, some operations that are efficient to perform on, uh, on, uh, on your mobile devices and then moving to the edge. And then from the edge, you can move to some more uh, serious, uh, you know, Heavyweight uh, infrastructure. So uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't advocate like a, a single solution. Of course, depending on the problem, right? But uh, I do. I do love uh, the idea of having solutions that can try um, uh, to uh, to adapt systems at, at different scales. Joe says, um, if you have to explain those core concepts, decouple, sparsify, and adapt to a high school math class. How you will dine and communicate the core concepts? Well, <laughs> these are, uh, uh, you know, uh, I haven't tried it uh, yet on, uh, on, uh, on my daughter, but um, uh, when we build applications, okay, uh, you know, we want uh, to build uh, our systems independent of uh, application parameters, 
Okay, and uh, we have, uh, uh, you know, I have seen this, for example, working, with, you know, like traditional, well, traditional, well, not uh, not learning systems, but data processing systems, for example. And there you have like very similar, um, uh, uh, you know, concerns, right? There are, you know, the application, you know, the query that you want to perform to the data has some parameters that will make your system go slow or, you know, or fast. And, uh, and you want to decouple them. And the same thing here, the interesting thing is that, you know, with machine learning, it's hard. Yeah, it's, it's harder. Uh, because you have to think of uh, two, you know, I think for, in, from my point of view, it's like two very hard problems. Okay, so one is model design, and the other one is, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, high performance systems. Uh, so uh, that's you know when it comes to uh, you know to decoupling and you know and specification is uh, you know you can achieve less with more I suppose uh, you know more so you can achieve more with less and uh, uh, you know adaptation is what it is. So Thank you, I, I, I will try. To, I, I would like to do a last question. I had a question I really had is that. Is that, for example, in, in, in the language model example, parameters are going faster than data. So basically, uh, the number of parameters have grown like uh, two, three times of uh, orders of magnitude, and data maybe is growing, I don't think exponentially, also a lot of repetition. So real new data, let's say it's growing linearly in the best case. Uh, what is the limit? Uh, so when we will reach overfitting? So, so uh, at some point, we, can, we add more noise than, than information. Um, uh, um, yeah, and uh, I think, you know, like I, I would just say the, the hardness of this is that um, I think it was in the GPT-3 paper essentially that they realized that they were having a mistake because they mixed up their training data and their, and their testing data because of, uh, you know, the reusing, um, uh, reusing data. Uh, because they couldn't, you know, like uh, it was like uh, an honest, you know, an, an honest mistake. But uh, uh, they were saying, "Oh, and uh, we cannot rerun it. <laughs> we can, uh, you know, we can, uh, we can tell you that there was this problem there, but uh, it was so expensive to, you know, it was so expensive to train that uh, um, you know we can, we cannot rerun." Um, uh, I would say. Uh, Ricardo, the following, you know, here at, uh, uh, I think there are a lot of sources of, of good data that are not being used for, you know, uh, uh, for training these language models. Okay, uh, and, um, and, and when I say, uh, you know, what do I mean by good? I mean that, uh, uh, you know, they are uh, task specific. Uh, you know, like, uh, um, uh, you know, like understanding, you know, like literature or um, um, historical, uh, historical data, you know, um, and uh, I think we still have to tap on them, but I wouldn't go in terms of volume, I would go in terms, you know, from the perspective of uh, finding the right task for the right data. Thank you, Alex. A great talk, uh, and and I invite all the people to to the our first uh, distinguished lecture speaker next week, Cynthia Rudin, very well known in interpretability. So I hope to see you also next week, Alex. Thank you, and and I hope to see you again in, in person. Thank you very much, and thank you for the opportunity. I really hope you enjoyed it. Okay. Yeah. Very nice.